Section 24 is entitled Space Coordinates and Vectors in Space. First thing we're going to do is plot a couple of points. Suppose we want to plot the point 2, 1, 3. Here is, actually, we want to plot, we want to draw the vector. I'm going to draw the vector. So first we have to find 2, 1, 3. This is the y-axis. This is the z-axis. This here is the x-axis. All three axes meet at a right angle. So on x, we go out to 2. And on y, we go out to 1. Actually, let's just scale this a little bit bigger. Here is 2, here is 1. Remember, the first value is x, the second value is y, and the third value is z. Well, let's first plot the point 2, 1. In the y direction, you go this way. x direction, you go that way. Z direction you go that way. Notice that this is parallel to X and this is parallel to Y. Now I do the exact same thing at three at, on the Z axis. If I can get this and then I go parallel to X, I go parallel to X. There we go. Well, I guess that can be a little bit better now. There we go. Now, right here is where X is 2 and Y is 1. I, I can see that very clearly. Because when I go to the X axis, there's 2. When I go to the Y axis, there's 1. Well, from that point, I just go up 3. There it is. That's the point 2, 1, 3. That's the point 2, 1, 3. What you need to learn how to do is just pick three points on the axis. Go like that. Draw a nice little rectangle up here. And then draw the third rectangle like such. Third wall if you prefer. You need to be able to start doing that. And if this is A, this is B, and that's C, well then there's your point. That's A, B, C. You should be able to figure out what those values are as well. Including these two. You should be able to state what each of the points are. For example, right here, the y value, see, we didn't go off the x axis. I mean, yeah, a a x is still zero. We didn't go in the x direction at all. So y is b and z is 3. When you go off the x axis, for example, this point, x will not be zero. In fact, it's a. That's A, B, but I didn't go up any. I didn't go up. Okay, you need to think about it. So if you want to draw the vector, well then you go from the origin to the point, and there's the vector. There's your vector.
you practice for 5, 10, 20 minutes, however long, until you're able to do what I just did. 5, negative 2, 2. Here is the y-axis. Here is the x-axis. Here is the z-axis. But to be honest, he has the, uh, the z goes down there. That's the negative z. Over here, that's the negative y. And over here, those are the negative x's. And in this problem, I need to have y be negative 2. So that's one point. Since that's the only negative, let me get rid of the other negative sides of the x and z axis. x is 5. y is the second number. It's negative 2. x is 5. For argument's sake, that's 5. And z is also 2. z is 2. Now, the only lines you can draw are lines parallel to this one, parallel to x, and parallel to z. So, for example, to go to there, you can go up and over. To get down to the negative 5 point from here, you have to go this way. So I do have a problem with that. This line that I drew was parallel to the x-axis, but this line was not. That means I made a mistake. It wasn't parallel to x, y, or z. This is parallel to y. That's another point. Now, I can come like this, have to go up like that. I can come down parallel to x, but then I have to come up. And if I do this perfectly right, when I join these two points, it will be parallel to the y-axis. But it wasn't mainly because this line wasn't really parallel to x. Now it looks more parallel. And there it is. There it is. You need to be able to do this. This point right here, that point is 5, negative 2, 2. And we can confirm it. I go to the x-axis. I go straight down. That's 5. I will agree that the z value is 2. Personally, Okay, what we so, so maybe that's wrong. What we really should do is first find, since we're more familiar, let's find 5, negative 2. Let's just find the x, y. That's going to be right there. That's going to be right there. Why is that? Because when I look to the y axis, x axis, I see 5. And when I look to the y axis, I see negative 2. And then from this point right here, I go up 3, 2, 2. If this was negative, I would have gone down. That's the point, sorry. That's the point 5, negative 2, 2. Basically, from the origin, from the origin, I went to where x was 5. That brought me right here. Then I went two to the left. That brought me to where y was two. Excuse me, negative two. This is x is five. Y is negative two.
2 since I didn't go up any. V is 0. Now I go up. And that brings me right there. This point is 5, 0, 0. This corner point, of course, is the origin. From here, I just go up 2. So this is 0, 0. V is 2. If I now go to the left, the only the two won't change, the x won't change since I went to the left. Remember now, left and right is y. Y change. It went to negative two. Zero, negative two, two. And if I now go this way, this way, that's the positive x-axis, and I went five. That's why. So the negative two stayed the same, but x increased by five. And this point right there. Well, from the origin, I'm just going to the left. So y becomes negative 2, but x and y did not change. x and z did not change. Okay. The dimension higher. Going from two dimensions to three dimensions. And you have to draw it on a two dimensional piece of paper. Okay, so in number five, we're given the vertices, well, here we're given, excuse me, the vertices of a triangle. We're given the vertices of a triangle in three dimensions. In space, two, negative, four, four. Of course, the triangle itself is two dimensions. Imagine taking this triangle and cutting it out of the board or out of the piece of paper and rotating it. Come right here and rotate it. Rotate it outside of the paper. Well, it is still the same triangle. It's still two dimensions. But the points are in space. The points are not on the board anymore. This point went in the board. This point maybe came out from the board. Maybe this point here stayed on the board. This point here. But nonetheless, they're in space. And the question is, what are, so those are the vertices, what are the lengths of each side of the triangle? So we can call this point zero, 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 and this one two, two, one, and this one two, negative four, four. So let us find this distance. The distances are the, the formula is the same in three dimension as it is in two. Subtract the x's. Remember, x, y, and z now. x, y, and z. Do 2 minus 0, square it, plus do 4, excuse me, negative 4 minus 0, and square it, and then do the subtract the z values, and square it, and then take the square root. 2 minus 0 is 2, you square it to get 4, plus negative 4 minus 0 is negative 4, you square it, get 16. 4 minus 0 is 4, square it. You get 16. If you do the calculation right, you'll add that up and get 36. The square is 36. Is 6. So one side is 6. And we also want to decide whether, actually, we want to decide if this is a right triangle, an isosceles triangle, neither right nor isosceles. So we want to find the length of each side. Let's do this one. The change from 2 to 2 is 0. When you subtract, you find the change from four, negative 4 to 2, from negative 4 to 2. Well, from negative 4 to 0 is 4, and then 2 more is 6, 6 squared. You want to subtract them, negative 4 minus 2, negative 6. 
Whether you square 6 or negative 6, you get the same answer. The change from 4 to 1 is 3. 4 minus 1 is 3. This distance, so 0 squared is 0. This here is 36 plus 9 is 45. 45 is 9 times 5. So it's the square root of 9 times the square root of 5, the distance. But I know the square root of 9. I do not know the square root of 5. Okay, so we have the length of the second side of the triangle. It is 3 times the square root of 5. Now remember, the longest side in a right triangle is the hypotenuse. Now let's find the last one. 2 minus the x, y, and z are 0. So 2 minus 0 is 2. 2 minus 2 minus 2 is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. You square them, you add them up. You get 4 plus 4 plus 1, which is 9. And you get 3. So those are the three sides. It's clearly not isosceles. That means two sides are equal. Now, is it a right triangle? You can square each of the sides, especially, now first of all, remember this came from square root of 45, especially if you don't know which side is longer. And here we get 36, and here we get 9, and here we get 45. You know what? These add up to 45. That is this squared plus that squared equal the third side squared. That's a right triangle. Where the square root, the, the 3 square root of 5 was along this side. That was the hypotenuse. So my picture is off, but that doesn't mean anything. And that means absolutely nothing. But it did follow the Pythagorean theorem. Now, if you don't, now if you want to not do it this way, if you want to find out which is longer, well, square root of 5 is more than 1. So 3 times more than 1 is more than 3. It's more than 3. Isn't more than 6. It's 3 square root of 5 greater than 6. And keep in mind, this was the square root of 45. If you square both sides, the right side be 36. If you want to square it from here, you get 9 times 5, which is 45. Or if you square it from here, you get 45. And yeah, 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 this last symbol is correct. 45 is bigger than 36. That is, 3 square root of 5 was bigger. So, is the longest side squared equal to the other, the sum of the other side squared? Is 45 equal to 36 plus 9? The answer is yes, it is. It is a right triangle. That is how you determine if you have a right triangle. Another problem. Suppose the vertices are 1, negative 3, negative 2. Another one is negative 1, 1, and 2. And the third one is 5, negative 1, 2. You need to find the distances between every two pair, any two pair. And call the points A, B, and C. The distance from A to B, for example, is the square root of the distance between the x values of 2, the distance between the y values of 4, the distance between the x values again is 4. So you get 4 plus 16 plus 16, which happens to be 36. And AB is 6. So we have AB, x on. Let's find AC. If 
from negative 1 to 5, that change is 6. From 1 to negative 1, the change is 2. I don't care if it's plus or minus 2. It's going to square root anyways. And from 2 to 2, well, there's no change. So we get 36 plus 4 plus nothing. We get the square root of 40. The square root of 40 is 4 times 10. I know the square root of 4. I do not know the square root of 10. So that's AC. Okay. Now we're going to find BC. From 1 to 5. From 1 to 5. The change is 4. Square root. From negative 3 to negative 1 changes 2. Square it. And from negative 2 to 2, the change is 4. And then you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I just saw that over here. Since addition commutes, the order under the radical can be different, but 2 squared, 4 squared, and 4 squared. 2 squared, 4 squared, and 4 squared. It's being added. I know that answer. It's 6. So I have a isosceles triangle. Now remember, AC was the square root of 40. And 36 is the square root of 36. It is the square root of 40 is bigger. The question is, is the square root... So now we have, is it going to be a right triangle like this? 6, 6, square root of 40. Which is also known as 2 square root of 10. It, is that going to work? Well, 6 squared is 36 plus 6 squared is 36. Does that equal to the square root of 40 squared? The answer, which is 40. The answer is no. 72 equals 40? No. That means the top line is wrong. 6 squared plus 6 squared, one leg squared plus the other leg squared does not equal the longest side squared. It is not a right triangle. No. So, it's isosceles. It could have been an isosceles right triangle. And after all, 1, 1, square root of 2 is isosceles. And it's a right triangle. Now, if you wanted to be slick, if you multiply this by 6 and this by 6, then the third side would have to be 6 square root of 2. But it isn't. It was it was 2 square root of 10. And the square root of 6 means 6 is the square root of 36 times the square root of 2. Why that's the square root of 72, not the square root of 40, which it would have to have been. It would have to have been the square root of 72 for you to have two sides of 1, 6. So we just call it isosceles. Isosceles. It's an isosceles triangle. So it's two sides are equal. But not right. Could have been right. So you find the distance between every two pairs and you see if the Pythagorean theorem holds. If you have two sides that are equal, you call it isosceles. If you have three sides that are equal, and you can call it equilateral. But you can also call it isosceles. The next problem is straightforward. Find the midpoint between 5, negative 9, 7, and negative 2, 3, 3. When we're in two dimensions, we added up the 2x values divided by 2, added their y values divided by 2. Three dimensions, we do the same thing, except you have to now do it to the z component. You add 5 and negative 2, you get 3, divided by 2. You add these two numbers, <coughs> you get negative 6, divided by 2. Here, those numbers get 10 divided by 2. That is the midpoint. 
of course we could reduce. 6 over 2 is 3. Now my fault is I'm going to put a minus sign in front of it. And 10 over 2 is 5. There is no midpoint. Okay, you don't have to do a million of these problems, but you might have to say a million times. If I have two vectors in R3, I have two vectors in space, how do I find a midpoint? And the x components divide by 2, comma. Add the y components, divide by 2, reduce, comma. Add the z components, divide by 2, reduce. Put brackets around it, that's your answer. Okay, very straightforward. If you had these two vectors, or these two points, excuse me. If you had these two points, how would you go and find the midpoint? Add them up, divide by 2. 4 plus 8 is 12. Divide by 2 is 6. 0 plus 8 is 8. Divide by 2. Get 4. When you add the z components, you get 14. Divide by 2, get 7. That is the midpoint between this point and that point. And just add the two points component wise and divide each of those values by 2. Number 11 is a nice problem. They tell you the center of a sphere is 0, 2, 5. They tell you that the radius is 2. You want the equation of the sphere. Well, it's just like in two dimensions with circles. It's x minus this value squared plus y minus this value squared plus z minus the z value squared. And this is equal to r squared, which is 4. The only change I would make is that x minus 0 is x. And when you square x, of course you get x squared. Problem is done. Now, the next one is cute. They give you the endpoints of a circle, of a sphere. They give you the endpoints of a diameter. 2, 0, 0. And 0, 6, 0. Now, so here it is. Let's suppose that's it couple of things. If you find the middle, the midpoint of that diameter, you then found the center. If you find the distance between the endpoints, you have the diameter. Divided by 2, you'll have the radius. Or you can find the distance between the center and either one of the endpoints. And that would give you the radius. Well, if you have the center, you have the radius, like we just did, you can write down the equation of the circle. The center is the midpoint of the endpoints of the diameter. The center is right in the middle of the diameter, the endpoints of a diameter. I mean, even in a circle, if I give you this point and this point, the two dimensions, if you found the middle, the midpoint, you found the center. So I add the 2 and the 0, the 0 and the 6, the 0 and the 0, and I divide by 2. Take the average. So the center is 1, 3, 0. I now have the center. I need to find the radius. 
I prefer to find the distance between those two points. That distance is the square root of the change from 2 to 0 is 2, square it. From 0 to 6 is 6, square it. From 0 to 0 is 0. We get 4 plus 36 plus 0. We get the square root of 40, which is the square root of 4, excuse me, times the square root of 10, which is 2 square root of 10. And one of the things I like about calling it D is D is the diameter. If I divide by 2, if I divide this by 2, I get square root of 10. That's my radius. My radius is half of the diameter. If I have the center and have the radius. So x minus the x value squared plus y minus 3 squared plus z minus 0, which is z squared, that equals to r squared, which is 10. And there is the equation of the circle.
So first I'm going to combine everything that has x's. Like x squared minus 2x. I'm going to complete the square. I'm going to leave a little space. Then I play the same game for y. Plus y squared plus 6y. Leave a little space. And the same game with z. z squared plus 8z. z squared plus 8z. And I'm going to bring the constant to the other side. This is negative 1. Complete the square. Take half of negative 2 and then square it. Half of negative 2 is negative 1. So when I square it, I get 1. So I add 1 on the left side. I have to add 1 on the right hand side. Make them equal. I take half or 6. Half or 6. Whatever I get, I square it. Get 3. Half or 6 is 3. Square, get 9. So I add 9 here, and I add 9 to the right side. And I take half of 8. Half of 8, and I square it. But half of 8 is 4. And I square it, get 16. So I write plus 16, plus 16. Now, each bracket is a perfect square. First bracket is something squared, plus the second bracket is something squared, plus the third bracket is something squared, and negative 1 plus 1 is 0, plus 9 is 9, plus 16 is 25. So it equals 25. What's being squared is x followed by half of that number, which is right there. Half of that number is negative one. Plus half for six squared half for six excuse me. Half of that number is what goes here. That's right there. Half for six is three. Positive three. Half of eight which is right there. That's where it goes next to the z. Positive 4. 4 is positive 4. The center is 1 makes this 0, x is 1. 1 makes this 0, y being negative 3. 1 makes this 0, negative 4. This value, 25, that's r squared. If r squared is 25, then of course r is negative 5 or positive 5. But it would be meaningless for the radius of a sphere to be negative. So here's the answer to the question. We found the center and we found the radius. We had to complete the square. Go back to your pre-cal and learn or review how to complete the square. Take half of the value in front of a linear term. Suppose you have 9x squared plus 9y squared plus 9z squared, and you take away 6x and you add 18y, and I, you add 1, and you get 0. Find the center and the radius. Well, first you should combine the x's and the y's and the z's and bring the constant to the other side. So we have 9x squared minus 6x, and that's it, plus 9y squared plus 18y plus 18y and plus 9z squared plus 9z squared and bring this over as negative 1. You want the value, the coefficient of x squared, y squared, and z squared 
to be 1. That means here I have to factor out a 9. Now, since you're factoring out a 9, and 9 doesn't go into 6, well, how about we multiply by 9 and we divide by 9? And then I factor out 9. And what I did in circle, that's what goes in the brackets. The x squared, the minus, the 6x over 9. But that can be reduced to 2x over 3. Minus 2x over 3. And at some point, in my constant. Plus, I want to factor out 9. But fortunately, 9 goes into 18. 9 times y squared is 9y squared, plus 9 times 2y is 18y. Plus, if you prefer, 9 to z squared. And this is equal to negative 1. I didn't make one little typo. I meant to add excuse me, to leave space next to the 2y to add on my constant. Now since it's z squared, I don't have to add anything. It's z plus 0 squared. And this is negative 1. Now, I need to take half of that number. I need to take half of negative 2 thirds. The 2's cancel, or if they reduce to negative 1. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1 over 3. And I need to square that value. I get 1 ninth. That's what I write down here. But am I really adding 1 ninth to the left side? Answer is no. I'm adding 9 times a ninth, which happens to be 1. If I add 1 to the left, before I forget, better add 1 to the right. Now, I take half of that number, half of 2, and I square it. Half of 2 is 1 positive 1. And when I square it, I get 1. So I write 1. But did I really add 1 to the left side? Whenever I say left and right side, I mean with respect to the equal sign. Did I really add 1? The answer is no. I added 9 times 1. It, didn't, it wasn't there in this line above. I added 9 to the left side. Well, before I forget, I add 9 to the right hand side. Okay. Now, what's the 9 stays, but what's inside the brackets is something squared. Plus 9 times. What's in the bracket is now something squared. Plus 9 times. I mean, what's in the bracket is simply z squared. And negative 1 plus 1 is 0, plus 9 is 9. What goes in the bracket is x followed by half of negative two-thirds. Half of negative two-thirds is right here. It's x minus a third. Y followed by half of two. Half of two is right there. It is plus one. So we're 90% done. I'm not 100%. Yeah, I guess I would take a point off if you stopped right here. <coughs> you should notice that you can divide each term by 9. That is the final, the final equation in standard form is this. This is the equation of the sphere in what's called standard form. In standard form, you can read off the center. What's being squared here? What makes it zero? One third. X being one third. The X is one third. What's being squared here? 
it's zero when y is negative one. What's being squared is is zero when z is zero. And one is r squared. What do you square to get one? One. So r is one. You have the center, you have the radius is one. You can actually go and draw this graph now. Excuse me, this sphere, which is a graph. get a basketball a radius one and put the center right where we said it should be and that would be your square. Okay. Now in the next problem they want us to find the component vector and they give you the vector and they do a perfect job drawing it with the axes perfect and etc. But this point here is 4, 2, 1. And this, the head is 2, 4, 3. And they want the component vector. That means they want you to move it to the origin. Basically, you move this, you take, you move it negative 4 in the x direction, you move it negative 2 in the y, and you move it negative 1 on the z, and you get right to the origin. Do the same to the head. That is, bring every point down the same amount. Now since it's starting at the origin, I describe the vector in component form by just listing that point. Well, I took away 4 from the x and 2 from the y and 1 from the, from the z. The tail was 4, 2, 1. You take away 4 from the x and 2 from the y and 1 from the z the tail becomes zero, which is what we want. You didn't need to do that. So I mean the y's, but I'm not saying I didn't mean to write it. I'm just showing you that we are getting the origin. We'll do the same to the head. Take away four from x and two from y and one from z. And what you get is the component vector. It's just like before. Head minus tail gives you components. If we wanted to graph this vector, this component vector, negative 2, 2, well, z actually, we can actually use more space. We have the z, the y, and the x. Since x is negative, since the x value is negative, let me go out here. So here, for argument's sake, is negative 2 on the x, positive 2 on the y, positive 2 on the z. I want to go from here to negative 2. And that's how I do it. The first line was parallel to x. The second line was parallel to y. That gives me the base. Rectangular base. Let's let this be more exact. If something could be more exact. Okay, let's draw the yz plane. The yz wall. This is direction z. This is direction of x. Maybe it's called the x z plane. I can go like this. I can surely go like that. 
and we're getting there. Parallel to x, so well, it should be right there then. There. Now, where is negative 2, 2, 2? Let's just first do negative 2, 2, 0. Well, I start at the origin, which is right there. I go to negative 2 on the x. That brings me right there. The y-axis goes this way. To go 2 on the y, to the right is positive. So, that's right there. That's where x is negative 2, y is positive 2, and z, I didn't go up any. And now I have to go up 2. Right up. There it is. That's the point we wanted. That's the point we wanted. Draw the component vector. Use the case. At this point, a component vector goes from the origin to the head. I meant to draw it perfectly straight, but there it is. There it is. Not, when you teach is not going to take out a ruler and make sure that your line was perfectly straight. I mean, you, you start doing things like that, it's going to be marked wrong. It's not straight. It's not even an attempt to being straight. Okay, so we found the component vector and we drew it. And that's done. 
zero of these, you multiply each of these values by zero. And of course, we'll get zero. They ask you negative v, which means negative one times v. I multiply each of these values by negative one. Let's graph them. This one right here is fairly e easy to draw. It is just the origin. It's just the origin. One point. Boom. Got it. Okay, let us first draw a V. Let us draw a V. Y axis, X axis, Z axis. Somebody asked you how big that angle is? You don't say, oh, that's more than 90, it's the 2. No, it's 90. It is a 90 degree angle. In drawing 3D, the two dimensional board makes it look obtuse, but it's the right angle. These are all right angles. Maybe here is a nice way of something wrong there. Oh, okay. All right, so let us draw one, two, two. Oops. X is 1, Y is 2, Z is 2. So using these three points, we make the walls. There's our cube. Where is 1, 2, 2? Well, let's first find 1, 2, 0. So I go to 1 on the x. Remember, the y goes in that direction. So I go in that direction, 2. So that's 1, 2, 0. I go up 2. That gives me 1, 2, 2. Now, actually, the rest is easy. Here is V. Here is V. I don't put the arrowhead. So I drew V. Now I want two V. It's twice as long. Okay. I'll kind of think about how long that is, and I'll try my best to go the same distance. There it is. It really should be on a straight line. It really should be on a straight line. There it is. Zero V we talked about. This, excuse me. Zero V is right here. It's just the origin. Negative V. That's just V in the opposite direction. <coughs> Remember V was just that long. So I go in the opposite direction, approximately the same length. And that's negative v. This vector is negative v. This vector is v. And the long one, 2v. So we didn't have to plot those other points. We just doubled the length of the vector. We went back in the opposite direction, the same amount. Okay, next problem. Suppose they tell you that u is 1, 2, 3. And they tell you that v is 
two, two, one. And I tell you that W is four, zero, four. And I ask you to find U minus V. That is one, two, three, minus two, two, one. And all you do is you do it component-wise. First component, second component, third component. Not because it says one, two, three. This is the first component, even though it's a two. The second component is a two, and the third component is a one. We subtract component by component. One minus two, negative one. Two minus two, zero. Three minus one, two. It's just three subtraction pro three subtraction problems written as one. That's all it is. Okay, so that's u minus v. Need a little bit more space for the next one. Suppose they tell you they want you to find z. Find z. And they tell you that two u plus v minus w plus 3z is 0. Well, what's 2u? You double every entry of u, you get 2, 4, 6, plus v, which is 2, 2, 1, minus w, which is 4, 0, 4. And then you add 3z, and you get 0. Now, you don't get 0. You, you get the zero vector, that is, you get zero, zero, zero. You get the zero vector, bold space zero. Right? Add two plus two is four, minus four is zero. Add the first component, combine the first component. Four plus two is six, minus zero is still six. Six plus one is seven minus four. Seven minus four is three. You add three z's, you get zero, zero, zero. Well, what must this be? It has nothing to do with six, excuse me, threes and z's. It has to do actually with everything else but the three and the z. Zero plus zero gives you zero. Six plus negative six gives you zero. Three plus negative three gives you zero. That is, I now know what three z should be. Three z's should be zero, negative six, negative three. And you can multiply and divide both sides by any non-zero number you like. I want to divide by 3. Or multiply by 3 if you prefer. So zero is, z is 0, negative 2, negative 1. We found z. Nice problem. Suppose the top one was longer. 
When I move it to the origin, it will look like that. And uh, this one would look like that. It would lie in a straight line. One will be a multiple of the other. They will be multiples of one another. That is, you can multiply one vector by some number, and it will give you the other vector. That's the only way two vectors are parallel. If one is a multiple of another. So, I'm going to give you a vector z. Even going to give it to you in component form. <coughs> the question is, which of the following vectors are parallel to z? Which of these vectors, if any, are parallel to z? Give you one more. Which of these vectors are parallel to B? Well, let's A, B, C, and D. Let's compare B to A. Well, what do you do to 3 to get negative 6? The answer is you multiply by negative 2. So well, that's going to have to be true for all the other for the other two components. If I multiply two by negative two here, I get negative four. If I multiply negative five by negative two here, I get ten. So letter A vector, the first vector is parallel to Z. What about the second one? What do you do to three to get six? The answer is you multiply by two. Okay. <coughs> If you take 2 and you multiply it by 2, you get 4 You're on a roll. If you take negative 5 and you multiply it by 2, you get negative 10. But that's not negative 10. So no, it's not parallel. Now, here's a hard one. You have Z is or harder one. You have this for Z, and you want to compare it to 2, 4 thirds, negative 10 thirds. Well, it's not so obvious what you do to 3 to get to 2. It's not so obvious what you do to 2 to get to 4 thirds. It's not so obvious here. So you ask yourself, let's start with 3. 3 times what? Unusual number gives me 2. Answer is 2 thirds. Okay. Multiply 3 by 2 thirds, get 2. And take the next number, 2, and multiply it by 2 thirds. Oh, 4 thirds. Correct. I take negative 5, I multiply it by 2 thirds. Negative 5 times 2 is 10 over 3. Yep, that worked like a charm. So, the third vector is parallel to Z. Now, let's look at the last vector. 1, 4, Two. Now it's real nice when one of the values, one of the XYZ values is one. So long as the original vector doesn't have fractions. If I know what to do to three to get one, divide by three, I get one. I read that. But when I take two and I divide it by three, I'm not getting negative four. That's enough for me to stop. So it turns out that this vector and this vector is parallel to Z. And there are two vectors, which are lines. If two lines are parallel to a third line, then they're parallel to one another. Here's a line. This line is line one. Line two is parallel to line one. And line 3 is parallel to line 1. Well, then, of course, line 2 and 3 are parallel. I think either that's called symmetric or reflexive property. Same 
question, except things would be given a little bit different. With respect to D, the initial point is at 1, negative 1, 3. 1, negative 1, 3. The terminal point is given as negative 2, 3, 5. So that's the information about V. And then they want to know, is it parallel to negative 6i plus 8j plus 4k and 4j plus 2k? 4j plus 2k. Well, first it would be good if we knew what V was. Remember, terminal means head and initial means tail. So the component is head minus tail. 2 minus 1 is negative 3. 3 minus negative 1 is 4. 5 minus 3 is 2. Okay, now this is the same as negative 6, 8, 4. What do you do to say 3 to get to negative 6? Now, I'm not suggesting that's hard for you. But if that one was hard for you, don't worry. Maybe you ask yourself, what do you do to 2 to get to 4? And you help times by 2. Alright, well, 2 times 2 gives you 4. 4 times 2 does give you 8. And this is the hard one in theory, so you do it on the side, you reduce, you cancel, you do whatever it takes. Negative 6, that works. Right. Now, this vector is no I's, 4 J's, and in our in three dimension space, you have a K direction. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Negative 3, 4, 2. I mean, if the Z doesn't change, and the X doesn't change, that is, we're multiplying by 1. Negative 3 times 1 is not 0. So this one failed, and this one was parallel. To B. The first thing you need to do is get everything in component form. Do head minus tail. Convert from IJK to component form. Yeah, 
actually, these are points. Do, do these three points lie in a straight line? These three that I listed. Well, if, for example, you found that vector from point one to point two, and then either you found the vector between point two and three, or you found the vector between P1 and P3. They would have, if they're parallel, if they all lie in the same line, this vector and this vector, they'd be multiples of one another. P1, P2, and this vector would be multiple of one another. P2, P3 would be a multiple of P1, P3. Just find two vectors any two vectors over here and see if they're parallel to one another. See if one is a multiple of another. Pick any two. I'm going to pick the first and the third. So, it starts here and it ends there. It starts at 0, negative 2, negative 5 and it ends at 3, 4, 4. Now you may say, well wait a minute, how do you know it doesn't go the other way? It's not going to matter because, well, Negative vectors are, you know, if this is V, and I really should have drawn it in the opposite direction, that's negative V. They're parallel. They're still parallel. So, I find that vector. We're calling this the tail, and that the head. So, V1, V2, I meant to say P2, P, P3, P2, P1, something like that. So we are finding this is P2 and this is P1. And I meant to live up to my arrow, but something went wrong. So I find the vector between any two points, P1 and P2. It's 3, 4, 4, that's the head. Here's the tail. I subtract. So the vector P1, P2 is 3, 6, 9. Then I take any other two any other two. I can pick P1 and P3 or I can pick P2 and P3. Any direction doesn't matter. Let me go 2 to 3. If I subtract them, and they are right in front of me, I get 1, 2, 3. So P2, P3, that vector is 1, 2, 3. And the question is, are these multiples of one another? Well, if you have one, you multiply it by three to get three. So, the rule is, if it's going to be parallel, is multiply by three. Two times three is six, looking good. Three times three is nine. Yes, they're parallel. That is, those three points, P1, P2, P3, they lie on a straight line. They lie on a straight line. Take any two points, find the vector between them, take another two points, just don't take the same two points. Take another two points, find the vector between them. Are these vectors parallel? One, two, four. 250015 0, 0, P1 P2 P3 These two 124 250 Subtract Get that Okay Let's subtract these two 2 4 Negative 5 Are these parallel? 2, 4, negative 5. 
Well, I know what to do to negative 1 to get negative 2. I multiply by negative 2. But when I multiply negative 3 by negative 2, I get 6. I don't get 4. The answer is no, they don't lie in the same line. They do not lie in the same line. They do not lie in the same line. They lie in the same, the three points, or four points, or 50 points, lie on the same line. You call them collinear. These were not collinear. terminal point. And what they give us is the component form and they give us the initial point. They give you the initial point. Initial point is a good one would be say 0, 6, 2. Now you need to remember the terminal point minus the initial point will give you the component form, the component vector. Now we don't know the terminal point. Call it x, y, and z. Well, we do know the initial point. They gave it to us. 0, 6, 2. And we do know the vector form. 3, 5, 6. Well, we have three equations. x minus 0 is 3. x minus 0 is 3. You all know that 3 minus 0 is 3. So x is 3. Some number take away 6 gives you 5. Some number when you take away 6 gives you 5. You know 11 minus 6 is 5. Y is 11. Some number z when you take away 2 gives you 6. Gives you 6. You know that 8 minus 2 is 6. 8 minus 2 is 6. So z is 8. And there is your terminal point, 3, 11, 8. And we can check if this is the terminal point, and here is the initial point. If we subtract, we should get the component form, which is exactly right, 3, 5, 6. Square root. 
0 plus 9 plus 25 happens to be 34. And the square root of 34 is a product of primes. It's 17 times 2. It can't be broken down. find a unit vector in the same direction as u. If I tell you u is equal to 3, 4, 5, I want to find a unit vector in that direction. Well, the length of u is 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 5 squared square root which is 9 plus 16 plus 25 which is 50 which is the square root of 25 times the square root of 2, which is 5 square root of 2. That's the length of u. So if you want a vector in the direction of u of length 1, that's what unit vector means. Well, the answer is that, that vector. The original vector divided by 5 square root of 2. That is, it's 3 over 5 square root of 2, 4 over 5 square root of 2, 5 over 5 square root of 2. But dividing by the square root of 2 is the same as multiplying the top by square root of 2 and multiplying the bottom by 2. So it's 4 times square root of 2 over 5 times 2. That cancels out to 1. So you just get square root of 2 over 2. A little bit more math. 3 square root of 2 over 10. 2 goes into 4 2 times. So you get 2 square root of 2 over 5. Square root of 2 over 2. That's a vector a unit vector in the same direction as u. What if you were asked for a unit vector in the opposite direction of u? Now, if this is u, and it has some length, well, negative u would have the same length. And it goes in the opposite direction. Negative u would be three, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. Not all negative numbers, but negative of this, negative of that, negative of that. If any one of those three numbers were negative, and negative u, they'd be positive. And then you divide by the length of negative u, which is still 5 square root of 2. 5 square root of 2, 5 square root of 2. 5 square root of 2. The only difference is, is the signs. We're going to get this same answer with negatives. Negative 3 square root of 2 over 10. 2 square root of 2 over 5. Square, negative. Negative. Negative the square root of 2 over 2. That will be a vector, a unit vector, I mean, so this is 1, in the opposite direction of u. Just negate each component. Find your answer, the unit vector in the direction of u, and then change all the signs. That will give you a unit vector opposite, in the opposite direction of u. Okay, think about that. of the vector d. 
That is, if I tell you C is 5 or negative 5, and I tell you the length of V is 2, then the length of CV, it would be the absolute value of C times the magnitude of V. So it will be the absolute value of negative 5 times the length of V, and it would be 10. This is definitely a formula you should walk around knowing, the one that remains on the board. You should just know this. In Calc 3, you're taking the class, you have to know this. Now, if V is, I don't know, 1, 3, negative 2, and I ask you to find the magnitude of 5V. Now, there's two ways of doing this. <coughs> You could say that 5v is 5, 15, negative 10, and find the lengths of this. But the numbers are pretty big. What if I said find the length of 15 v's? So you'd have 15, 45, and 30. You don't want to square each of those numbers and add them up and find the square root of it. What you want to do is first, uh, see, don't do this. You're given this, and you're asked to find the length of 15v. First, you should find the length of v. 1 squared plus 3 squared plus, for argument's sake, we can say 2 squared. 1 plus 9 plus 4 square root of 14. Okay, so this will be the length, the absolute value of C times the magnitude of V, which is the square root of 14. It's just 5 times the square root of 14. Done. You don't have to make the numbers huge. In fact, if somebody gives you V is equal to 25, 50, negative 75, huge numbers. You can say, you know what, I'm a factor of 25. 25 times 1, 2, negative 3. So the length of V is the length of this. Think of this as W, and think of that as C. It is just going to be the absolute value of C, 25, times the length of W, which is the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared. I dealt with much smaller numbers. 9 and 2, 4 is 13, and 1 is 14. 25 times the square root of 14. You don't want to square 25 and square 50 and square negative 75 and add them up and take the square root of that. Use the rule backwards. Factor it out. It's a good rule to know. Remember though, you have to take the absolute value. Suppose I tell you that U is, I don't know if we did something like this. If I did, I think I made a slight mistake. Find, if I want to know what C is, because the length is 1. Okay, now remember, the absolute, the magnitude of CU is the absolute value of C times the length of U. And we want this to be 1. Well, what is the length of u? The length of u is 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 1 squared. It's 4 plus 9 plus 1. Is it always the square root of 14? Okay. So what we have is 
the absolute value of C times the square root of 14 is 1. Or 4 the square root of C times We have this. I'm just rewriting it. I divide by the square root of 14. Cleaning this up, it's the square root of 14 over 14. So the absolute value of C is the square root of 14 over 14. So C can be plus or minus this number. And after all, if C was negative this number, the absolute value of negative this number is square root of 14 over 14, and the absolute value of a positive number is the square root of 14 over 14. So C can be one of those two numbers. C can be one of those two numbers. Now, let me give you the head of a vector, 4, 3, 0. Let me give you the tail of the vector, 1, negative 3, 3. And let's suppose this vector goes like this. I want to know what point is 2 thirds of the way. I want to know exactly what that point is. Now, the way we're going to do this, so now I know that this is two-thirds of the entire distance. If I put it at the origin, if I put it at the origin, that vector at the origin, and then I can find out what that point is. So the length is two-thirds. I can find this point. And then I could bring everything back and I'll have the point that I wanted. And not the easiest concept. You have to see this one. So if I do, if I find a vector component by doing head minus tail, 4 minus 1 is 3, this minus that is 6, 0 minus 3 is negative 3. So now, that's this vector. That's this vector. It originally started here and finished here. Head and tail. So now this 3, 6, negative 3 is this vector. It ends right here. Well, I want to know what that point is, two-thirds of the way. I want to know what that point is. Okay. So, let's find the length of 3, 6, negative 3. It's 3 squared plus 6 squared plus 3 squared. It's 9 plus 36 plus 9, 54. 54 is 9 times 6. So the length is 3 square root of 6. The length is 3 square root of 6. I want two thirds of that. I want two thirds of 3 square root of 6. That is, my length is going to be no length function. Excuse me. Okay, so maybe I didn't need to find. Yeah, I didn't need to find the length. I just need to take three, six, negative three, and take two thirds of it. I want two-thirds of it. If I took half of it, I find 
the vector that went halfway. I find the vector that went halfway. Find two thirds. Two thirds is three is two. Two thirds is six. Two thirds is six is four. And two thirds of negative three is negative two. Okay, so I'm sorry, I didn't need to find the lengths. I didn't need to find the lengths. I'm sorry about that. So now, since I drew in the graph a lot, let me draw the new one. Here was initial and the terminal point. I want to know the point that's two-thirds. So what I did was, is I brought it to the origin. I wrote it in, vec in component form, and I found the end point. It was 3, 6, negative 2. And then I even found the three-quarter, the, the two-third point. It's 2, 4, negative 2. Now, let's think about it. It used to be 1, negative 3, 3, 4, 3, 0. Now, what did I do to every point? Well, I brought the x value down 1. I added 3 to the y value. And I took away 2 from the x value. Took away 3. That should be 3, 6, negative 3. In fact, I took this away. That is, I took away the initial point. And that brought this point here and this point there. I took away 1, negative 3, 3 from every point on that line. Well, to go back, I should add it. I take 2, 4, negative 2, and then I add back the 1, negative 3, 3. I add it back. And in this case, I get 3, 1, 1. point on that vector we're taking away the initial point.
from claiming that from Q to Q. The Q is the head. 6, 8, 2, and 1, 2, 5, that's the tail. So the vector component, this vector down here is 5, 6, negative 3. Okay. And I want two thirds of that. So I want two thirds of 5, 6, negative 3, which is 10 thirds, 4, negative 2. That's that point right there. But now, what did I do to the points along PQ to get this component vector? Well, it's right here. I took away 1, 2, 5. I mean, from the term, from the initial point, when I take away 1, 2, 5, I get 0, 0, 0. From the terminal, if, if I take away 1, 2, 5, I get the new endpoint, which is right here. 5, 6, negative 3. That is every point I took away one from the x, two from the y, and five from the z. Well, if I have a point on the vector component, component vector, I add back one, two, five. I add back one, two, five. Remember, one is three thirds. So I get thirteen thirds, six, three. That's the point right there. That is the point. Okay, understand this. You cannot memorize these steps. And if you do, what's the point? Get a higher grade and learn anything. Square root of 3. Y is the square root of 3. 
And we know x is 0. That was our premise. x is 0. y is the square root of 3. And z, z is 1. Okay. But what about the other case that I mentioned? What about the other case? Off the positive x-axis, that's also 30 degrees. Remember, y and z. Well, if the vector is of lengths 2, this is negative 1, this is square root of 3. So, this point here, well, x is 0, y is positive the square root of 3, and the y value is negative 1. So those are both answers. You can just sneak in plus minus one, and this represents two points. One, zero square root of three plus one, and zero square root of three minus one. Those are their two answers. That's the easiest way of doing it, to go back to two dimensions. If one of, if one of their if one of x, y, and z is constant, then it's just two dimensions again. It doesn't even have to be zero. It could have been five. I think my answers were zero squared is three plus minus one. Well, if it turned out that z was always, excuse me, x was always ten, then it would be that. I would have done everything the same way, except instead of writing zero, I would have written ten. Or forty or whatever they told me x equals. They said x is constantly 3. We'll do one more. V lies in the xz plane. What that means is y is 0. y is 0. And has a magnitude of 5, the length of v is 5, and it makes a 45 degree angle, makes a 45 degree angle off the x axis. So I named the axes x and z. I could have reversed them, I could have put x instead of where z is and z where x is, but I didn't. Well, again, we get two different answers. This is 45 degrees off the x-axis, and if I went down here, it's also 45 degrees. Now, we know it's 45 degrees, although this doesn't look good, sorry. And yeah, let me draw it a little better. 45 degrees. We know that this is usually 1, 1, square root 2. But I don't want the vector to have lengths of square root of 2. I want it to have lengths of 5. Well, what do you multiply the square root of 2 by to get 5? Well, there's two ways of doing this. You can say square root of 2 times y equals 5. There's one thing you know how to solve a linear equation. Another thing to be able to write one down. Say so x is this which is 5 squared root of 2 over 2. That is, I multiply all sides by that amount. Or, you can be real slick. First, let's get 1. First, I want this product to be 1. I have square root of 2. I divide by square root of 2. Now I have 1. I have 1, I multiply by 5. You better believe I'll get 5. So I get 5 over square root of 2, just what I got before. Clean it up. See, so each side it's multiplied by 5 square root of 2. 5 square root of 2. 5 square root of 2 over 2. And again, when I multiply the third side by 5 square root of 2 over 2, well, square root of 2 times 2 is 2. It kills off the 2 on the bottom. And yes, I'm getting 5. My length is now 5. Okay.
question was, is to find B. To find B. To find this point. Remember, the second value is 0. The x value, this one. Now, if we're down here, this piece is still 5 squared to 2 over 2 for both of these points. This point and this point. For the, for the top one, the z value, remember, z is this number. 5 squared to 2 over 2. And when we go down, it'll be negative 5 squared to 2 over 2. So once again, we get plus minus. 5 squared root of 2 over 2, comma, 0, comma, plus minus. 5 squared root of 2 over 2. That's your answer. It represents two points. One point being with the positive, and the other one with the negative. Those are your two answers. Shorthand notation, you can write it as one point. Multiplying by 1, 
the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2, which goes into 4 2 times. So you get 2 square root of 2 over 3. So the cosine of the angle 2. Now, I'm real concerned about whether or not this is bigger than 1. They like to get everything under a square root sign. Like 4, I meant to say 2, is the square root of 4. And the square root of 2, of course, is the square root of 2. And 9, I meant to say 3, that's the square root of 9. 4 times 2 is 8, over 9. This is less than 1. I mean, after all, 1 is the square root of 1. So, since 8 over 9 is less than 1, then that's the symbol that should go here. It's less than. This is less than 1. If it was more than 1, we'd be in trouble, because the cosine of no angle is more than 1. And two vectors have an angle in between them. I mean, any two vectors that meet is an angle in between them. That means that, that means you, you did something wrong. If the cosine of the angle is 2 square root of 2 over 3. So the angle is the cosine inverse of 2 square root of 2 over 3. Go and figure that out to a few decimal places. slide a few sections ago. The next thing we should talk about is when things, when vectors are parallel, perpendicular, which I never understood why they changed the name. It's now called orthogonal or neither. Well, remember that the cosine of the angle is u dot v divided by the length of u times the length of v. Now, if the two, if they're orthogonal, that means the angle, well, let me not do it that way. Here's vector u and vector v. If it's orthogonal, they mean at a right angle. And the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. I'm assuming u and v are not the zero vector. So, this won't be zero, and this won't be zero. We can't talk about the angle between this vector and that vector. The first one is a nine vector. You have to have some length. Now I can talk about the angle in between them. So, a frac so if this is zero, or if this equals zero. If a fraction is zero, that means the numerator is zero. Orthogonal means u dot u dot v is zero. And it doesn't matter that I wrote the wrong letters because in a different problem they might have different letters. They might have v and w. The product, the dot product of the two vectors must be zero. Now, if vectors are parallel, if vectors are parallel, well, this vector, this vector, and this vector, parallel. This angle, 180 degrees. This vector and this same vector are parallel. Zero degrees. Cosine of zero is 1 and the cosine of 180 is negative 1. So this is when cosine theta plus minus 1. This is when 
cosine theta is zero. Okay, so if you get anything other than plus one, minus one, or zero, then you say neither is neither parallel nor orthogonal. Suppose I tell you u is j plus six k, and v happens to be i minus two j minus k. Remember that j plus 6k really means 0i plus 1j, 1i minus 1k. So the cosine of the angle is u dot v. 0 times 1 is 0. 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. 6 times negative 1 is negative 6. Unfortunately, that's not zero. That's not zero. Now we have to divide by the lengths. The lengths of u is 0 squared plus 1 squared plus 6 squared. 1 plus 36 is 37. Square root of 37. And the length of, not u, but the length of v is 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. 4 plus 1 plus 1 is 6. It is the square root of 6. And 36 times 6 is 182.22, I guess square root of that. 42, 2, 2, 2. So, the angle will be, so the cosine of the angle is negative 8, and let's just do it this way. 2 goes in here, 4 times 2 goes in here, 1, 1, 1 times. So the cosine of the angle is that number. So the angle would be the cosine inverse of 4 square root of 2, 2, 2 over 1, 1, 1. of u 
on to V. Okay, we'll do one more problem. Suppose you come to know that U is one, two, two. They want us to find the direction cosines of U and demonstrate that the sum of the squares of the direction cosines is one. Well, we need to know the lengths of U. It's one squared plus two squared plus two squared square root. These are four, four plus four is eight, plus one is nine. The square of nine is three. So the cosine of alpha is defined to be one divided by the length. The cosine of beta is defined to be the y value divided by the length. And the cosine of gamma is the z value of u divided by the length. Okay, so alpha would be the cosine inverse of the third. Beta would be cosine inverse of two thirds. And gamma would be cosine inverse of two thirds as well. And this is a calculator problem. Okay, that completes the section space coordinates and vectors and spaces. Vectors and spaces.